Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Lynn Kemmer. I'm the Community Outreach, Workforce, Veterans, and Local History Librarian at Kern County Library. And I'm also the County Coordinator for the One Book Project. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting um, our moderator today, Eileen Diaz, who is a graduate student at CSUB in our local history room. And we got to talking, and through discussion, this panel was born. So thank you, Eileen. Eileen kindly introduced me to Donato Cruz, who um, wrote his master's thesis on this topic, and he'll be sharing information in the presentation along with Jesus Garcia um, after my introduction. All of these individuals here today have an integral working knowledge of our topic of redistricting and redlining effects on black, indigenous, and people of color in Kern County. Kern County Library is honored to hold the space and host the guests today to lift up their voices and promote positive change in Kern County. So thank you all for being here. Um, and they're giving their time at no expense, so we're very grateful. <clears throat> Before we begin, I'd like to talk a little bit about the One Book Project. Uh, the One Book Project is a countywide effort that invites everyone to read a book and the title select and select is selected by committee uh, at CSUB, and a lot of that has to do with um, if the author can come and do a, a talk in a book <laughs> So we're always really grateful when the author is able to come and do that. Um, this year, the book title is A Mighty Long Way, My Journey to Justice at Little, uh, excuse me, at Little Rock Central High School by Carlotta Waltz Lanier. And Miss Lanier was the youngest of the Little Rock Nine, and her story, is about school desegregation in the racist South in the late 1950s, early 1960s. But even more so, it's a story of profound courage. So we're really excited to meet her at CSUB at the Ocardo Center on October 27th at 7 p.m. The One Book Project takes place between September and November and hosts programming across Kern County Library System, partner organizations in the community, and culminates with an author visit at CSUB. The read in the programming is meant to bring our community members together across cultural divides and support learning and literacy. Please be sure to pick up the brochure and flyers on the table on your way out. Um, we have a lot, lot of programming to come the end of October and early November and uh, free to the public also. So Kern County Library locations, so here at Beale and then also at CSUB and at the Walter uh, Stern Library. Also, um, they have an event coming up as well. So all of that information is on the flyers on the table. And thank you all for being a part of it. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Donato Cruz and Jesus Garcia. Before moving on, I'd like to um, read their credentials. Uh, Donato has presented his research on housing discrimination at two national conferences, most notably the Western Historical Association in 2019. In 2021, Donato's master's thesis was cited in an interim report issued by AB 3121, Task Force to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans. The report cited Bakersfield's use of racially restrictive housing covenants and Donato will now present the history of housing discrimination on a national level and also in Kern County from 1938 to present. Jesus Garcia is a, uh, excuse me, demographer, how do you pronounce that? Demographer. Demographer, excuse me, statistician, and 2020 U.S. Census Partnership Specialist for Dolores Huerta Foundation, Equitable Maps Coalition, EMC. Redistricting panel and contributing member of UCLA's master's, oh, excuse me. Um, okay, I've got a run on sentence here. So he worked with Dolores Huerta Foundation on the Equitable Maps Coalition, and he is also a UCLA map, he has a USA, UCLA, UCLA master's in urban planning, I'm having difficulty talking. So without further ado, here's Donato Cruz. Thank you for everyone coming today. Um, I'm going to start my presentation with um, 
talking about racially restrictive covenants, those were housing agreements between sellers and buyers. And I'm really gonna be covering the period between 1938 and 1950. And this is the time period where um, housing agencies like the FHA, Federal Housing Authority, and HOLC, Homeowners Loan Corporation, uh, authorized the use of this language. And I'll kind of explain that history. So uh, because of that narrow gap, it's uh, during the time that that language was used. So that's why I'm gonna talk for a 12 year period. But then I'll, I'll develop some more, so. Go to the photo, sorry. Oh, the other way, sorry. It's the photograph. Thank you, that, okay. So this sign reads, no color trade solicited. We can see that right there on the left hand, or right hand side. Um, and the written handwritten, handwritten language says, sign on Roadside Fountain, Bakersfield, California, July 10th, 1946. So um, for a long time, uh, these types of photographs have not been available to researchers. Um, so they may, some may have memories of these types of signs around Bakersfield. So I ask um, you to think about does your community debate um, the existence of racism and kind of that legacy. So this is just more to think about it. And um, from other research that I've spoken to, this is more of a one-of-a-kind uh, find. Not that they didn't exist, it just, uh, I bring up the question, why don't they exist in other archives or other research institutions? So, um, going by there. So, for people that are familiar and maybe not familiar, this is what's considered a redlining map. And it's a residential security map, as we can see here on the legend. And what that meant to um, loan agencies is where their investment would be worth the most. And red uh, from research has shown that it had been more uh, communities of color, Hispanic communities, Asian communities, which meant very little access to home loans. So they're often referred to as redlining maps. The green, the A, the B, the blue, and the C still meant loans. So this is a map for Bakersfield. Historians have commonly uh, use these to refer to kind of the racial boundaries in a city. Um, this is for Fresno. This is the closest uh, map that we have to Bakersfield. And the reason Bakersfield doesn't have one is because when they created these maps, they only did it for cities that had a large or moderate population. Bakersfield in 1938 didn't have a large enough population for it not to be created like this. And I'll later show some of how we've been able to create a similar version of this through our research, so. Oh, low down. There you go, okay. So we can see the valuation. So some of this uh, grading, so the way they established these colors was to show grading. So we have the valuation, civic and social and community centers. It's actually grading for a Hillcrest neighborhood in East Bakersfield, and this is from the FHA. So as to show that even if the maps weren't in your city or they weren't drawn for your city, that uh, FHA and HOLC still graded those neighborhoods. Uh, some of it was on kind of the quote unquote desirability traits. So the FHA was established during the New Deal in 1934 and in 1938, they um, were kind of establishing the most profound kind of effects for real estate. We can scroll down to the next. So this is um, an example from their underwriting manual in 1939, where they uh, suggest that uh, real estate agents use racial restrictive language. The, you can see the G, prohibition of the occupancy of the properties except by race for which they are intended. So this is at the national level. So they're prescribing this to all cities across America, not just the American South. It has a profound effect, so we can scroll down. So this is the language. So this is from many covenants. Uh, through my research, I've been able to see 171 racially restrictive covenants, and their language is very uh, cookie cutter, kind of very uh, expected. It usually reads no part of the said property can be used or occupied or permitted to be occupied by any person not of, the, not of the white or Caucasian race, except 
such persons as engaged in bona fide domestic employment of the owner, therefore, or those holding under said owner. So the, uh, the restrictions were pretty codified here in Bakersfield. And then right below it, we have uh, examples of the code of ethics of the role of real estate agents by the National American Real Estate Boards. And we also have the real estate, uh, California Real Estate Association, where they also recommend to not introduce a person to a neighborhood or a character of property of which they could clearly, clearly be detrimental to the property values in that neighborhood. And this is some of the stuff they consider as ethical, right? So this is how profound it goes. It goes from nation to real estate boards to the actual state real estate board. So it has a profound effect on the development of California neighborhoods. So we can just go down. So we also have um, notable uh, people that also created neighborhoods that had racially restrictive covenant. Here we have uh, Floyd Main, who was a previous board of supervisor and also the namesake for Lake Main. And then we also have the uh, uh, La Cresta neighborhood, which was uh, also built by um, Colonel Howard Nichols, who is the namesake for the Nichols School on the east side. He also built homes that were racially restricted. I believe he built two uh, full tracks. So this is the map of Bakersfield, and uh, with the help of Jesus, we were able to plot all the uh, neighborhoods that had racial restrictions. So this is just the greater Bakersfield. We actually have 171 neighborhoods. They go uh, Delano, Arden, Lamont, uh, Fraser Park, Taft. It's a very expansive building of Bakersfield. This is just a glimpse of the greater Bakersfield. And to get like a size uh, reference, if people are familiar with Bakersfield College, you can see that. So some neighborhoods are very big, and some are bigger than the actual college. So you can see how expansive they are. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about the neighborhood with the star. So the neighborhood with the star was the opposite. Uh, we have real estate agents um, that also establish black only neighborhoods. And it's only to uh, kind of, there was a lot of uh, complaint about that uh, people of color couldn't get new homes. So they built new homes in the already kind of ad hoc uh, segregated neighborhood. Right, so if you consider this like the red line you map, the yellow star is a red line, and then the rest are neighborhoods that are proved, uh, proved since we have the benefit of hindsight as historians. We know that a lot of these neighborhoods are already populated and they continue to be populated. So this color coding actually isn't related to that. This is more about how, when the neighborhoods were established. Some are older neighborhoods, we can see the yellow. The neighborhoods are established in 1893, but the covenants aren't submitted to much later. So once the FHA um, uh, advises to include race restrictions, the influence is great enough that they actually establish restrictions well after the neighborhood being established. So we have kind of that profound influence in real estate. So this is the other side of suburbanization of this post-war development of housing. And this is out of the uh, Crisis Magazine. This is a letter that was sent from a regional worker here in Bakersfield uh, where he described the deplorable housing conditions. And for the sake of time, I won't read the quote, but um, I do have a worksheet with QR codes. If you'd like to look them up later, I've linked to some of these sources as well so you can read them yourself. But it's basically describing uh, that there are no sanitary facilities, they have outhouses, um, that you know um, there isn't like street lights and things like that. And it's, it's a very poor condition compared to what we're seeing in the post-war development. And we can see that next. So this is the other side. It's a bigger school, a, a, a comfortable place to live. And we see this kind of counter to areas of poverty where the bigger school is being marketed as a newer and bigger city because of this post-war development. And here we can see Bakersfield College. Bakersfield College has actually moved after the 1952 earthquake. It's actually by where BHS is, if people are familiar, it actually gets moved by 1956 and repositioning the new wealth to the new East Bakersfield. So you kind of see that, so. And these are for advertisements. So I'd like to point out this uh, specific case. So in 1948, uh, we have a lawsuit, uh, Shelley versus Kramer, 
that have laws that use a racially restrictive covenants. But it isn't until 1950 when the FHA says that they're not gonna finance loans with racially restrictive covenants. So it's really not the lawsuit that has a profound impact, it's the FHA themselves, but the profound impact is minimal. It's only the, the lack of using of language, right? So they don't refer to race, but this means segregation isn't a hard line. So this is an account from 1960. This is uh, from a magazine. They actually have copies here at the, the Beale Library. We also have copies at the Historical Research Center, and I have a QR link to those articles so you can read them if you want to read them later. But this is an account of a black family that's being harassed, and this is a timeline of times where they're called names, when their kids are being harassed. And it's a, it's a very vivid account, 12 years after Shelley versus Kramer, when supposedly uh, segregation has ended by then, right? So it, it ends in a community forum, and this is a response uh, the next month uh, from neighbors who uh, don't want black families to move in. There's a, a vivid accounts, multiple narratives of people not wanting to have black neighbors, and this is 1960 as well. So in that neighborhood, it's the Hillcrest neighborhood. So I put the map right here, so kind of show that it does have a legacy of restrictive covenants. So that's the map. And that's the restrictive covenant. So these are actually all in the Hall of Records. Um, you can actually go find them and read them. That's how I did my research. But we can see here uh, in the section, it's very blurry, but it, it, that has the uh, section five, no part of said realty shall ever at any time be used or occupied or permitted to be used or occupied by the persons not of the white or Caucasian race, exceptions such as employed as servants upon said realty by the owner or tenants of said realty. Actually, uh, reading there on, oh, so it's, it's very specific. <laughs> and then I'm gonna pass it on to Jesus who's gonna talk about uh, some of these maps that Jesus just created. Oh, no, you're good, keep on going. How's that? I'll keep on going. I'll keep on going. One more. You're good. Okay, so I'm going to pass it on to Jesus, who's going to talk about these maps, and uh, some of this is based on historical data. disenfranchised communities, blacks, Latinos, uh, other cultures, um, from the political sphere. Um, whether it's the Board of Supervisors, the uh, Big City School District, uh, City Council, uh, purposeful gerrymandered lines has stalled the progress of people of color from entering the political power suits. Uh, what I'm gonna present right now is a comparison of 1990 data and then jump to 2020 data, a 40 year span, but in many ways, it is the exact same situation that we were dealing with in 1990. So, um, things could have been worse, at least the board of supervisors, except for the case that uh, over the past 40 years, the board of supervisors has been either sued or under threat of sue um, to create lines that were at least adequate. The first was in 1990, uh, under Joaquin Avila, and a group called the uh, Hispanic Educators, of which Tomas Martinez, Professor Kastik, was part of that group. And so what I've been showing here in this map is 1990 population counts of African Americans overlaid on top of the 1980 Board of Supervisors. Now clearly, as you can see from the map, this is, in this case, what I'm showing is the African American community. The African American community in this case is divided into two pieces, District 5 and District 2. Now to give you a sense of District 2, District 2 goes all the way across the Mojave Desert and, and, and is a huge, huge county even, even back then. So again, what we have here is the African American community divided into two pieces. They're small to begin with, 
But here, they're split, they're cracked even more. Let's go to the next slide. This slide shows you again 1980 geography, which in the redistricting world is a preference for most political boundaries. Politicians like to keep the status quo. They like their voters, they like their geography. So in all the instances of, of, of redistricting that, that are worked on, um, and Lori can um, tell us, the status quo, the entrenched politicians wanted to keep things minimal. And so if Kern County wasn't under threat of lawsuit by Joaquin Avila. Google his name. He is the leading Latino civil rights attorney uh, in, the, in the country, uh, the founder of the California Voting Rights Act. And so here is the what I think would have been the preferable for the supervisors in 1990, 1980 geography, now Latino population. What can you see from this map? You can clearly see, again, two concentrations of population. The Latino population, uh, east of, um, of Indian Avenue, East Bakersfield, Niles, and the like. And then here on the, on the, to the lower right, we have Arvin and Lamont. Again, 1990 data. And now what's important about the 1990 data? That's the first time that the Census Bureau um, actually collected information on persons of Hispanic origin or Latino origin. So that's, that's that. Now let's go on to the next slide, please. In the next slide, what I have here is, is now I show white population. So as you, again, 1980 geography, uh, white population, and as you can clearly see, both District 5 and District 2 have a significant concentrations of the white population, white non-Latino population, meaning that if you were to, they, in both instances, because of the voting and, and other instances, they would outvote those populations. So, so in this case, again, not only were blacks and Latinos cracked, but now, because of, 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 of the voting trends that we would you know, normally see under, under this scenario, their voting strength would be uh, next to impossible to succeed. Let's go to the next slide. So now, let's look at the same geography, I mean the same population data, but with a different geography. What we have here is the first um, District 5. Again, this didn't come about under the goodwill of the county and everything. Oh, let's, let's see what we can do to you know, make sure that the diverse population has, has more opportunity. They were threatened by Joaquin Avila, Hispanic educators, and others to say, look, we have the population counts to create a Latino majority district, and this is the result of that. As you can see, clearly the Latino population is together at one, and then also the Arvin and, and Lamont are all together. So, uh, a, 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 a monumental shift in the politics of Kern County began. Uh, Pipara is the person that uh, in 94 became, 95 or so, became the, our first Latino supervisor. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So what did this do? Well, for, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. Let's go back up. I didn't say it. <laughs> let's go back up. This is the African American population. So as you can see here, the African American population is wholly within the fifth district. Again, giving them an opportunity to have an influence in that district. Let's go on to the next slide. In this case, I can, we can clearly again see the Latino population um, is, is holding together uh, up in um, East Bakersfield, the Long Island, but now Arvin and Lamont make up uh, the rest of the district. And what was the result? 1995 96, Pete becomes our first Latino supervisor, and, and except for Karen Go, who was appointed in that position, there's been a Latino in that seat. Let's go to the next slide. This is again the white population. You can clearly see how by extracting uh, the black Latino population, the white population is, is, is outside of the sphere of this district. Now one thing that's missing here, and this is why I'm glad our leave is here, is we have at this point um, a growing Indian, Punjabi population, which wasn't recorded in the 1990 census. So it, they were invisible, uh, an invisible component of that. But so, as you can see here, that's why the area around the 5th district is even less, if you will, white population, uh, because the missing component here are uh, other ethnic groups, uh, primarily Punjabi and Indian, and we'll see that later on in some of the maps that we're pursuing. So let's go on to the next slide. So now let's jump ahead 40 years, okay? So, let's go back up. 
So what do we have here? Isn't this a beautiful map? What we have here is the adopted map of just a year ago of the, of the board of supervisors. Now, you guys have heard the word gerrymandering. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. This map, again, it, it, it does, if you look at this map, and then we look at the 1980 map with the, with the, with the 19, uh, 1990 map with the 1980 geography, we have the exact same scenario. We have the African American community, which is divided between District 3 and District 5 almost evenly. So their strength is cut in half in two districts. So what does that say about them being able to field a candidate, you know, move the progress, move their agenda on for the community? It's half of what it could have been. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Now, this is 2000 population with the 2000 board uh, 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 supervisors. As you can clearly see, the Latino population has grown exponentially throughout Bakersfield and Kern County. So to restrict that population from having more of an influence on the political process, at least the Board of Supervisors, they had to crack it into four districts. It took four districts. It took districts two, three, uh, uh, four, and, and, and five to keep the board, to keep a majority Latino board. I mean, look at this. Look at the boundaries. If, 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 if we just eliminated any of the data, the geography itself will tell you these do not follow traditional uh, rules of redistricting. And Lori, I'm sure we'll get into that more extensively. Let's go to the next one. Next, next slide. Finally, this is again a clear indication of the shift of the white non Latino population away from the downtowns, away from the southwest, and primarily north of the river, and Hagen Oaks, Southern Oaks, and the like. So, and again, what we have here in Districts 2 and Districts 5 and, and parts of Districts 3 is the growing strength of our Punjabi community and of other communities that are coming together. The result of that change we see in um, in the Board of Super in uh, Bakersfield City Council. And again, I'm sure our people talk about that. But we have created a opportunity district for the Punjabi community um, in the seventh district of the, of the city of the Bakersfield City Council. So these are the statistical facts of our community. I've been I've been doing this a while. <laughs> This is, you know, the only other job I had before this, I think, was uh, shoe salesman at J.C. Penney's, but I've been working in this field um, the majority of my, of my life. It's part of the, the final slide. So here, now, now, these are our proposed districts. I'll move through these real quickly. Again, this is proposed district three, African-American community, as you can see. Uh, good, a good portion of the African American community would have an impact on District 3. It's part of the next one. Again, Latino community. Now, the Latino community has a significant impact in districts uh, 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 3, 4, and 5. Now, District 4 is the district that was created under the, under the Luna. But here again, we can see the. So we, these, we've created three majority Latino um, uh, population. What we proposed, they did not get adopted, obviously. Go on to the next slide. And then again, we can see clearly that the, uh, the lack of, of, of a white non Latino population in District 3, obviously District 4, District 5, indicate that if you add the Latino and the African American community, it would be the Punjabi and other ethnic groups. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Donato. Um, I'm really happy this panel's happening. When I heard it was happening, and that Harleen was on it, Renato, Jesus, I met everyone except Lori, Henry. <laughs> um, I was really excited to hear that it uh, was gonna happen and that this topic could reach everyone in a public forum. 
Uh, so I'd like to begin by introducing the rest of our panelists. So first we have Harvin Kor. Harvin Kor is the previous Kern County Community Organizer for the Jakarta Movement. Uh, she was born in Bakersfield and raised with an extreme passion for community building and empowerment. Throughout her time in the position, she advocated and organized for the Punjabi and Sikh communities in Kern County, particularly by empowering and educating her community on the importance of redistricting and of the dangers of gerrymandering with the help of her colleagues, valued partners, and student volunteers. Her experience on the ground with door-to-door -door canvassing uh, sheds light to the importance of face-to-face -face interactions and organizing, despite being in an era dominated by digital organizing. Next, I'd like to introduce Traco Matthews. <coughs> Traco is an advocate for justice and equity in the local community. He was instrumental in keeping, I'm sorry, in helping keep communities of color, such as Punjabi, Hispanic, Black communities, uh, together in preserving their collective voice and voting power during the city of Bakersfield's redistricting efforts in early 2022. Next, I'd like to introduce Lori Pesante. Uh, uh, on, on behalf of the Dolores Puerta Foundation, Lori facilitated the education and engagement of thousands of Central Valley residents and dozens of organizations in the 2021 redistricting process, ultimately forming what is now known as the Equitable Maps Coalition. The Central Valley will feel the positive impact of the Equitable Maps Coalition for decades to come as the coalition has shifted the balance of power to be far more in alignment with demographics, especially those of historically marginalized groups. The coalition completely reversed the ratio of Voting Rights Act, the VRA, uh, districts to non-VRA districts at the state and federal levels, increased county supervisorial VRA districts by 135%, saw the adoption of the first true community coalition map ever in the history of Bakersfield, and successfully passed two bills in the state legislature, AB 2030, Arambula, and AB 2494, Salas, establishing the independent redistricting commissions of Fresno and Kern counties. Uh, next, uh, we're gonna start with the panel discussion. Um, so I'd first like to begin uh, with a question for Donato Cruz. So first, uh, Donato, why is redistricting research important? So I'm gonna start with housing research. I think housing research is also important to see kind of the legacies and then with the redistricting maps and the housing maps that we created, we can see that a lot of uh, these communities are still in some of these older uh, marginalized communities, so some of the old segregated neighborhoods. We're also seeing in some of the maps that has shown that we can see the patterns of shifting of demographic population so you see what we, uh, as historians, call white flight is where uh, whites uh, leave older and more aging neighborhoods, and that becomes affordable housing where people of color more likely live. So we can also see the shifting of power as the population kind of shifts. So for my maps, the racial concentrations are really downtown, really the what we call the, the new East Bakersfield, where we think of like the Kern County um, General Hospital, right? And then we also have Bakersfield College on so the 50s, that is the new East Bakersfield, um, Alta Vista and all those older neighborhoods. We also have uh, some of what we think of the old Southwest, not the new Southwest, so about around Ming Avenue. So um, it, that isn't really our collective new memory, but in the old memory that was the, uh, the new Southwest at that time was the Brundage going uh, south to Ming. So those are the older post-war neighborhoods, right? So in the 50s and, well, the 30s to 50s, those are the newest and booming communities, right? And then they shift southwest, as we can see in the 80s, and then now they're moving northwest, and we're seeing the, the boundary shift with uh, the changes in housing and demographics. So I think that's important to look at. Thank you, Donato. Uh, the next question is for Trico Matthews. How has redlining impacted you and your family personally? You, you all have a mic. In the better. You have your own mic. Oh, it wasn't working. <laughs> oh. oh, my bad. <laughs> if it goes out, I'll just use my big boy voice. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Um, this is much better. <laughs> Last of all, a little longer. But thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm honored to be here. And my primary reason, honestly, for wanting to be part of this is really for, for all of you. you can, so you can put a face with the stories. Um, because it's one thing to see data 
um, on the screen about housing, about redistricting, et cetera. Um, but these stories have impacted real people, and I am one of them, and I, I'll share just a couple. So I had no idea um, that I was a, a victim of redlining until I turned 40 years old. And um, I kind of always believed some of the hype that some folks in my family and externally are always like, you know, Traco, if you want to be successful, the reason you don't have any wealth is because you're not as smart and you're just not quite as vigorous or hardworking as everyone else. <laughs> and uh, that was not true. And then I picked up a book when I was 40 years old called The Color of Law. And if you've read that one, a lot of the research um, that Donato spoke to is explicated there. And as I'm reading the book, I remember literally crying because I recognized for the first time that so much of this happened not in some other state, but in the state of California. And that was meaningful for me because I was born in Fresno, California. I grew up in Sacramento, lived in South Sac, um, near West Fresno, all redlined areas. And then my wife grew up here in Bakersfield and my um, paternal grandmother also lived here in Bakersfield while I was a child. But what impacted me first was the story of my grandfather, who will be 100 years old February 19th of next year. Yes, that's pretty awesome. And over the course of his life, he has had a tremendous legacy. Um, he graduated from Howard Law School after fighting in World War II. He was literally there on D-Day. Um, he remembers some stories. Um, and after he graduated from Howard Law School in 1954, uh, they moved out to California. He wasn't welcome in Bakersfield. They already had one black lawyer, so they told him, go to LA. So he went to LA. And um, one of the things that I discovered while reading the book, and this is the story I wanted to, to share, is they also talk, in addition to what was happening with FHA and some other things, uh, veterans were also not treated the same, at least black veterans. So most veterans, when they were done fighting, you know, World War II, they, they beat racism and Hitler and everything else across seas, and then they came back and fought against racism at home. And he did as well. In fact, you know, while it was illegal for them to racially discriminate against people in the state of California when he moved here, uh, they found a different way to impact him. So some black veterans couldn't get loans in other states. California, you could, but they didn't give all veterans the same amount of money. What I mean is this. So average cost for a house in the mid 50s nationally in the state of California was about $8,000. And so if you were a veteran, you had fought in World War II and you came to wherever you were living and you were a white veteran, you got 100% of that loan. So right out of you know, the war, you could purchase a house. That was the goal, that was the intent. How much do you think my grandfather got? got 5,000, which wasn't zero, so they could say, well, we didn't discriminate, we gave them something. But they gave them about 67% of what everybody else got. So what that did, well, to, to put it in comparable terms today, it would be like if a house cost $300,000, they gave him about two, and said, all right, come up with the other 100 yourself, if you wanna live in the same neighborhood as everybody else. And of course, he was unable to do that. So it drove him to purchase property um, in a poor area. Um, and then my, my grandmother, she struggled with mental health issues and so they eventually divorced when my dad was seven years old in the late 50s. And she had no money, obviously. He had a, a house in a poor neighborhood and so the only place where she could live and where my father grew up was in Watts, LA. And so lots of stories and impacts there. Um, he still feels traumatized whenever he hears sirens because you know, before the Watts riots in the 60s, he says the uh, police used to come into their neighborhood and chase them every day. Uh, not just some days, seven days a week, they would come into the neighborhood and look for young black boys to, to pummel. And so um, those were some of the impacts. My grandfather um, and then also my father um, growing up in areas that were redlined. So my grandfather, I'm sorry, I meant to share, he bought a house in East LA because he couldn't afford Panorama City or some of the other suburbs where other folks were purchasing houses and ultimately um, you know, seeking equity and the wealth that comes along with that. And I'll share a little more about that later. Thank you. Thank you, Trico. Um, 
The next question is for Jesus Garcia. How was census data collection and technology changed? Sorry, I read that wrong. <laughs> How has census data collection and technology changed for 2020 redistricting process? Were there any unexpected surprises from the latest redistricting process? Technology and the census, two of my favorite subjects. <laughs> the Census Bureau has been at the forefront of technology and innovation since the beginning of the 1990s. Uh, the census was the first to use a non-military computer, Univac 1, in, 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 to process the 1950 census. They created a thing called FOSDIG, Film Optical Scanning Device to input to computers uh, for all you students, that uh, would be a Scantron. It was developed in the uh, There was a guy named Herman Hollerth, German immigrant, PhD Columbia, worked at MIT. He created the electronic mechanical punch card system to process the 1890 census. He also created a little thing called IBM. I don't know if anybody heard that. <laughs> um, for 2020, the census uh, continued that innovation. Um, the 2020 census uh, utilized satellite imagery technology to check on addresses. Uh, it was the first online self-reporting system. I, I, I don't recall getting that information. Uh, it was the first to collect data on a mobile device. Now, I forgot to mention, but when I used to work at U.S. Census Bureau headquarters in 1981, we had a visit from the Census IT department, 1981, and somebody brought this thing and told us this is the, the, the collection of the census. So back in 1981, the census already had the first prototype laptops for data collection. Uh, they also utilized something called um, Interactive Tools Respond Outreach Area Mapper, Rome. What Rome is, is, uh, Rome was, is a live interactive uh, website where you can track how things were happening live. So the Bureau was collecting, reporting to the public live how census data was collected. And I need to give a shout out to all of the um, the folks that participated in the census uh, participation efforts, the Chikara uh, Movement, the Lord Huerta Foundation, and the other thousands of people that participated in the process. Because I was working again as a partnership assistant with the Census Bureau, and we were getting reports, daily reports, that told us that Kern County in the Central Valley was one to two to three percentage points ahead of projected data collection. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're collecting data on five, six, seven, ten million people, that one or two percentage point was a significant jump. And again, it's thank you to Jakara, thank you to the folks. So, the, so the, in, in inclusion, what I want to say is the, the, the census utilizes the best technology that's available uh, today, but we couldn't have done it we get in the past sense. The census could not have done what it did here in the Central Valley and in California without the work and the benefit and the buy-in from the rest of the community. So thank you, you know, former census employee for basically creating in California and in the Central Valley one of the best reporting, self-reporting processes for uh, the census. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the next question is for Lori Pasante. How did engaging in the redistricting process teach you power structures, teach you about power structures in the Central Valley and Bakersfield? Um, I couldn't have asked for better uh, folks to speak before me because they teed up this question perfectly. And I want to say thank you to the Kern County Library for choosing this book as their one book, one Bakersfield selection. I started listening to the audiobook version with my children on the way to school on the first day of school. And so they got to imagine what it must have been like for Carl Carlotta Walls Lanier to be the first as they as my children were going to school. It was it was hard for my kids to think about that, and especially with um, 
the other things that happened later in the book and that she tells, um, it, it really hammers home everything that we're talking about here today and the fact that history is not just in a book, we're still living it. We're living the, um, the cause and effect of everything that Donato shared, everything that Traco shared, everything that Jesus shared and that Harveed will soon share. In my role in the Equitable Maps Coalition work, I was tasked about two and a half years ago with teaching people about redistricting, and <laughs> let me tell you, that is not easy. Uh, redistricting is a very challenging topic. You start looking at the maps for the first time, and like your eyes start crossing, you're like, oh my god, all these maps, I don't even know what this is. But after two and a half years of looking at the maps, boy, I'm really glad that I have that experience. And we basically collected community of interest surveys, thousands of them across the Central Valley. We went to swap meets, we went to vaccination clinics, we went to you know, churches and community groups, we went door to door, we went everywhere. We collected them online. I, every single person whose email address I have access to has gotten probably way too many emails from me about participating in this process. And, and I'm sorry if you're still getting them, apparently some people have something like automatic on their events that tell them that we're still having meetings, we're not. So you can delete that. Um, but what we were able to accomplish together, it was like a crowdsource redistricting work. And nothing teaches you more about power structures than engaging meaningfully in the redistricting process. So even though the topic of redistricting is sometimes daunting, vale la pena, it is worth it to get involved because there is nothing that is going to more effectively show you about the nature of power, the structure of power, the, the, the lifeblood of power, wherever you are, and then you can extrapolate to other jurisdictions bigger than your local area, because everything I'm about to tell you is very much applicable across the United States. Luckily, California invested in the census because they knew billions of federal dollars were at stake, and so you can thank the state of California for making that investment. Other states did not. And it has a lot to do with what Donato shared because the power structures in those states very much are still in alignment with the uh, disadvantages that are built into the system. When we brought everybody together to start creating maps, we started really looking at well, what what is a fair allocation of political power in Kern County? Because that's, that's what the decision makers, in this case the Board of Supervisors, they are constitutionally required to allocate political power fairly. That is their charge, it is their duty, it is their legal and moral obligation. So we looked at what that would look like. And indeed, we used equity indicators. And in this case, and I'm sorry I don't have them up there, but you, know, you can see the heat map here and I'll share the, the salient information. We saw immediately that in Lamont, the average, uh, the median household income is $31,549. Um, the median household income in Seven Oaks is $124,211, right? And you can see kind of the comparison across Kern County based on our own knowledge that it follows similar patterns, right? Well, here's insight number one that we got. And it was a real aha moment on that Zoom meeting. We heard one of the supervisors say in a redistricting hearing, and by the way, the Fair Maps Act uh, uh, requires every jurisdiction, uh, county and, and cities, to put the videos of the redistricting hearings on their websites and to maintain it for 10 years. So if you think I'm not telling you the truth, go watch that video. And if it isn't there, please tell me. We have some reporting to do. Uh, one of the supervisors kept asking about Old Stockdale, Old Stockdale, Old Stockdale. And I was like, why is this supervisor? I didn't, I'm sorry, I don't even know what Old Stockdale is, right? I had to look it up. But that's when I came across this map. It's a voter turnout map. Guess what the highest percentage of voter turnout is in the entire county of Kern? Old Stockdale, right? And I was like, oh, that's why he wants that. So when Jesus showed that map, uh, of District 3, there's a reason it's weird. It's not weird when you think about who wanted it created that way, right? Now District 4, Board of Supervisors, same thing. We took a look at 
Delano, Wasco, McFarland, Lamont, Arvin, they're all in District 4. But the west side of Bakersfield has exploded in population and of course has the most expensive home. We, we looked it up on Zillow. We found, I didn't even know we had houses in Bakersfield that were $3 million. That was like, I was like, wow, we're in it. Now look at this, we got multi-million dollar homes, that's crazy. Wow, and it's all pretty too. But then you realize, you do the numbers, that little portion of District 4 outvotes every single farm worker community in District 4 by a huge margin, huge margin. So, and, and, and additionally, you know that, I mean, I'm not the only one who has pretty maps, right? Um, the county has access to, you know, their planning department and permits that have get, gotten filed. So they know everything about, you know, what's getting built out of West Bakersfield and the nature of those properties. So you know that they were already extrapolating into the future to preserve, and I think we saw a taste of this um, in the LA City Council reporting, right? I mean, what an insight into what conversations were happening among elected leaders all up and down the state and throughout the country throughout the redistricting process. This is why we passed that legislation. The legislation that says it's an inherent conflict of interest for the very person running for that office to be deciding who their voters are. That is not okay, right? Do, do, does, do the elected leaders get to come with you into the polling booth and tell you, oh no, no, you're filling out the wrong bubble. Like, they don't get to do that, but yet that's what the current process allows them to do. So we passed that uh, redistricting, uh, independent redistricting commission bill, and there's a million dollars in funding set aside to fund it. So I really encourage everyone here who is really benefiting, especially from, from this book selection and from the knowledge that's being shared with you, to um, consider applying to be on that commission. Um, it, it really is, I mean, we need folks that are gonna be from the community, not connected to elected leadership, people who understand that it's not okay to outvote every single farm worker community in the entire county. Like, that's not okay. The other thing I wanna note too is that we made use of the racially restrictive covenant data. It was uploaded as a layer. And another like moment that made the hair stand up on my arms in a Zoom meeting with all of our Equal Map Coalition members who decided to continue participating. We looked at um, a part of the map that had a designated uh, racially restrictive covenant um, item and a person who lives in that area said, we just experienced a hate crime right, right in that area, like right around that area. And um, I'm not trying to suggest that they're necessarily connected, but it was a stark reminder for us all on the call that data and maps and you know healthy intellectual you know analysis and debate is one thing it's another thing when the things that we're talking about become a matter of life or death for people and that's why i'm really grateful to Traco for sharing his family's experience because this is not just an intellectual exercise power structures are not just a matter of whatever we want to argue about on twitter or whatever social media we're on these days it's a matter of the people, all of us, all of us, and uh, coming together and making sure that we don't just have an iceberg of power structure in the county of Kern, where only a few get to be on the top and everybody else gets to drown. Like, that's not okay. And as long as I draw breath on this planet, I will fight against it. For Harvey Kohl, what was the importance of grassroots efforts such as the Jakar movement, uh, the movement's work on the redistricting process? Thank you, and hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you to all of the amazingly talented folks that shared the panel with me. Um, 
they are truly the reason why I gained so much knowledge in regards to redistricting, because as Lori mentioned earlier, you look at those maps and your eyes really do cross, and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I looking at? And despite being born and raised in Bakersfield and knowing you know, the social implications that we're all aware of growing up here, um, the, I hadn't seen the data before, and the proof was really in the pudding. <laughs> it was evident, it was apparent, so contrary to just the norms that I had seen growing up, I uh, was born you know, at Mercy Southwest Hospital, raised on the east side, was the only Punjabi individual in my class at Highland High School, so you know, it was an interesting experience to say the least. <laughs> um, assimilation was on the forefront of my mind, although I did not know that word even existed when I was in middle school and beyond, and then going and furthering my studies, you know, kind of uh, gaining that social knowledge. And so um, I guess really, truly at the core of it, the, my passion for our community really was sparked when I saw the lack of involvement from our community and the Punjabi communities, um, certain um, involvements, but not to the capacity that we had, right? That untapped potential. And that was no coincidence, of course, right? We see that there are certain untapped communities very um, strategically, or maybe not as intentional as we might think, but subconsciously. And so seeing those effects um, really inspired me to come back into Bakersfield and not to move, not to leave co to college and be like, okay, mom and dad, I'm staying out here forever, never coming back to Bakersfield. I was further inclined to come back home through the political um, work and the grassroots efforts that Jagada lays with their uh, pipeline. And so starting from high school and empowering young students to college and having specific chapters on campuses to really um, strengthen and build that knowledge for our community that it is important to come back home. And we need youth in our community and we're seeing all of that translate into the current political climate, right? And so grassroots efforts, going back all the way to high school, we have so many um, high school programs across the state where we're educating our youth, um, the Sikh Punjabi youth, because Sikh, Sikhi and Punjabi um, culture are so intertwined despite being religion and a culture, they're very interconnected and um, integral to one another. And so educating children, educating students, empowering them, showing that they have the the uh, capacity, they have the knowledge, the resources to back them and their efforts and whatever they would like to achieve and the change that they want to see in their community. And so the grassroots effort really started when uh, Lori approached us, Jesus, and other stakeholders in the redistricting process and the, the Equitable Maps Coalition were really like, hey, the Punjabi community is being divided and we really, really need to ensure that our voting power is not diminished. And we need to ensure that what's been happening since the 30s and the 50s and so on and so forth, that historically we need to change the narrative. And really it was a matter of just a few days where we were knocking on doors, going street by street with students, not adults, students, uh, high schoolers who are maybe actually some of them our youngest were 12. 12, 13, up to uh, some college students who go to UC Santa Barbara, but we're raised here. And coming back home for our redistricting um, city meetings to ensure that, okay, despite me having finals, I'm coming back home because I know that this is where my bread and butter is. This is where I was born and raised and I want to reinvest everything back in our community. So our high schoolers um, that fall within the KHSD district knew that this is extremely um, extremely important to them and their community and their parents and they know that we invest in right now into our community we're going to see an output maybe five years from now for their children in 20 years or whatever it may be right um, so educating them and ensuring that they have all of that knowledge so students were ready to go they were like okay dd which means sister and not be like when are we going door to door how are we doing this how do we even talk to people? How do we talk to strangers and knock on their door and just say, hey, make sure you show up to this meeting. You don't know about redistricting because it might not have been like as publicized as we wanted it to be, but come to this meeting. How do you convince, how do you have high schoolers convince our community members who have never known anything about this, right? So we're training our students, our volunteers, our uh, members in, within the Chicago movement 
to earn our community to say, you know, Harvey, uh, the next question is for Donato Cruz. How has redistricting research impacted us today? Okay, so uh, the uh, redistricting research that packs us today. So we can see some of the, uh, at least some of the historical legacies of Jesus. Uh, and I just got Jesus maps like today, so I'm gonna focus on his, and it's some of the newest things that I, you know, you can only dream of as a researcher, but. So kind of showing the demographic and the, and the shifting, right? And you can kind of see how the power has been uh, kind of transferred with the changing demographic. Kern County has become a primarily Hispanic community now, and we can kind of see kind of those structures and powers. In uh, 1950, the demographic was about 93% white, so a very minimal uh, African-American, uh, Mexican, Asian population. So kind of looking at those uh, demographics and looking at how the boundaries of power have shifted over time, also how neighborhoods have shifted over time. I, I think it's also interesting with the, with the uh, conversations you have with people and it kind of unites you to the research. Uh, I know I, uh, I was raised by the uh, Valley Plaza and that used to be a somewhat affluent neighborhood and, uh, or if it wasn't affluent, but affluent, it was like middle class, right? And I had some people that, um, that I grew up with and I had a conversation a couple of years ago. He's like, I told my friend, he was gonna buy a house there, and he says, "I don't know." He's like, "The neighborhood wasn't was wasn't it wasn't what like it was when we were kids." And it kind of means the repositioning of power, the, the taking away of some social services, right? And and that's actually a county island. I don't know if uh, people know what county islands are. They're kind of like these little kind of county cutouts, and they're in they're scattered throughout the city. Uh, we have some there are in the uh, Stockton Country Club area. We have some there at Valley Plaza. And uh, some of those places are the, well, in some places are the most service, and in some places are the least. So where my parents live, they actually don't have curbs. They, they don't have any curbs. And petitioning the city and trying to go there and get some, some advocacy, uh, you get very little uh, kind of attention. The most attention you get is like, hey, if you can afford it, you get a contractor. But trying to get the uh, county to like put it for all of us, because it would make it a lot safer to walk around in a neighborhood. They, they are not interested in that conversation. So I think some of the research puts you in some of your daily struggles as well and, and shows you how important it is to, to actually research and you know and look at primary sources, secondary sources. As a historian, you're kind of guided by the evidence you find, but also the evidence isn't necessarily what's readily available. Sometimes the evidence is in people's homes. Sometimes it's uh, you know in places where they charge you a print, like the Hall of Records where I went. Um, and I've had my own struggles with their fees, but uh, that's why I had to read 171 documents because it was uh, $3 every first page. And I was looking somewhere about $1,000 just to print papers, and I thought that was exorbitant, so I just read them all, and I made a list. And uh, you know, that's, that's what you have to do as a historian. Sometimes it's, it's struggle, but that's what primary research drives you in, in that drive, and so hopefully that does just The next question is for Traco Matthews. Do you think the impact of redlining extend to your circle of family and friends today? Thank you for that question, absolutely. And I, I could talk for probably an hour on some of the impacts, but I'll, I'll try to narrow it a little bit. So the first area where I think it has a significant impact today is in um, accumulation of wealth specifically black people. So one of the things that um, they talk about in the color of law is um, how the greatest transfer of wealth in American society is through what? Your house. And so um, redlining had a significant impact, um, as I mentioned with my, my grandfather, my father. Um, they were not able to pass down any wealth. My grandfather moved, he ended up becoming a superior court judge. Los Angeles, the first black man appointed by Governor Reagan back in the 80s. I know, kind of cool, uh, conflicted about who appointed him. <laughs> but my, my father was already long gone by the time he finally moved to Culver City, all right, out of East LA. And by the time my parents finally bought a house you know, for themselves that could gain some equity and whatnot in Lancaster, California, I was already living here in Bakersfield, 30 years old. <laughs> and so I remember being in college and you know thinking, man, how is it that all these other kids um, at UC Davis, like their parents are literally buying them houses to live in and I'm donating blood so that I can eat. This is crazy. I, I think I'm smart, I'm hardworking. What's, what's the difference here? 
And it's just that wealth disparity. And as of two years ago, I think the latest data showed that the average black family has $17,000 of wealth accumulated, and the average white family has $171,000. Uh, those numbers may have changed after COVID. All of that to say, the impacts with wealth disparities are significant, and they impact every other aspect of life. Um, I grew up in Fresno, and I went to a church of Grant and First. So it's kind of uh, in the middle, just uh, you know, near downtown. And it was integrated. About half the families were white, half the families were black. Every single black family that I knew in that church um, lived in West Fresno in the projects. And their lives and the lives of their children demonstrated where they grew up. What I mean is they had way more run-ins with the law. They didn't have the same level of education. Their schools weren't as good. Um, and while most of them you know, were good kids and eventually they got solid jobs and whatnot, it was in their 30s or 40s. No wealth accumulation. And so um, I think about the impacts to the people I grew up with. I think about my own family. I'm one of seven children. And that had nothing to do with redlining. That was just uh, poor religious doctrine. But out of the seven, only two of us own homes today. And that's about the average for black families in America. Uh, at, at times, three of us have owned homes, and the rest of us have struggled. And so that percentage um, of home ownership, again, has such a significant impact on the wealth and then everything else um, associated with the greatest marginalizer, which is poverty. So it trickles down. I, I get the question often, because I have conversations about potential reparations, and people always say, Traco, slavery was, it ended almost 200 years ago. What are you complaining about? And I tell them, well, it, you know, if, if, if only that were the case, and I didn't still feel the oppression that has trickled down from my grandfather, the stories that I have, to my dad, and my mom, who grew up in Oklahoma, that's a story for another day, segregated Oklahoma, to me. And now, my wife and I don't have children, but I see my nieces and nephews and even the struggles that they have as they are coming of age and trying to go to college, but nobody has money to send them to the nicer schools. No one has money. I was just talking to my um, older brother in Sacramento yesterday. He has a son who's very gifted, competent, talented, wants to start a business. Zero dollars to help with starting that business because most people that are entrepreneurs, they have some wealth to get them going. Um, or maybe they take out a million dollar loan from their father. So all of that to say, um, the impacts trickle down, have trickled down for generations and continue to me, my direct family, and then to the circle of friends and, and frankly the black communities that I have lived in and around all my life. The next question is for Jesus Garcia. California reallocated prisoner population to last known home locations. What impact did this have on local Kern County or Central Valley redistricting? The, this is actually part of the census's technology. Um, because the Census Bureau has created such innovation, it literally became much more easier for people to do redistricting. Um, Lori and I met a lot of folks who knew a lot about redistricting because they had the computers that had the data and, and, and attached to them. Um, what the Census Bureau, at least in the state of California did, is they extracted the uh, prisoner population in the state of California and reallocated them to their last home address. Now, why is that important in Kern County? It's important in Kern County because we have a significant prisoner population, I think over 20,000 20, people or more. And a bunch of those people are in District 4. So in 2018, under the Luna case, that prisoner population, of which a majority population are Latino, exaggerated the Latino population in District 4, meaning they could showcase to the judge uh, that, hey, we have 65% of the population 
is Latino here in, 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 the, in the District 4. That includes Hagen Oaks, the highest median income uh, community, and Arvin Lamont, the lowest median income. What the, by reallocating that population, it reduced people who would not have an impact on the political process. So it, it forced the county of Kern and the rest of the state of California to get a truer picture of what it is that was the population there that could then be used to create districts and then have an impact on the political process. So uh, that is the reason why we have a much fairer um, allocation of political process. And again, this is something that's, that's native to California, and I think maybe native to one or two other states in the rest of the California, in the rest of the United States. It isn't the case across the board. And so, let's say Texas, for example, um, you know, the prisoner populations or whatever are still embedded. And so what we have here is not only um, districts that um, have a disproportionate population of people that will not impact the political process, but they are used as proxies to bump up, bump up a certain figure. So, um, Draco and others, I could talk about for days on these topics, but uh, technology and the ability to remove these populations I feel like has, a, has had a tremendous impact. And uh, just as a side note, um, the, there were 12,000 people in the state of California, which we were not allocated, they were probably prisoners from, from outside of uh, California. So what happened is the sum total of population in California was reduced by that 12,000. And so you're gonna see going forward where the counts of a particular district um, don't match the sum total of the state of California. It's because of that. It's a little bit of nerd thing for you guys to, to consider. So again, thank you again to the ability for technology and technological innovation to do the right thing. Um, on behalf of better representation in the state of California. Thank you, Jesus. The next question is for Harveen. After maps were put in place, how did boundaries impact the Punjabi community as far as political, social, environmental, and educational influence? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, if y'all haven't seen on the 99 by now, we do have multiple, not just one political can candidate for Ward 7, um, at council, and so we see the way and the the implications, the effects of redistricting and the maps that we have put in place. So it really is has had a dramatic effect on our community as far as empowerment goes, and as far as politically, environmentally, socially, and educationally. Even uh, as I mentioned earlier, amongst the youth. So it's not just our older generations that are being impacted, but also young folks who are looking up to folks like Manpreet Gaur or Dr. Deal and saying, oh wait, I have the capacity, I have the ability to even run for office? That's never been done before here in Bakersfield. We've never seen a Sikh Punjabi woman or man run for council. And so you see with the redistricting process, folks have been empowered. I mean, the energy in the room during those redistricting meetings were, was electric. <laughs> and we had folks, community members, bringing in Ja, which is Punjabi tea, and uh, folks saying like our chants of, of you know, celebration. And it was really just, it was a very celebratory time for all of us because we realized in that moment that together, when we are united as one community, and not just the Punjabi community, but all of our allies, that we have so much power. And so in that power, and realizing that power, and effectively using it past digital organizing, because we've seen through this campaign that that's not just enough nowadays. Despite TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and the news and whatnot, digital organizing has, will not always be the way. That's not the most effective. So it's the door to door, you know, going back to the point earlier of the, the grassroots efforts. So those in turn resulted as um, that political and social. So politically, the candidates and folks being inspired to really get engaged in this voter process. We have our voters now who are even more empowered. Their um, vote is stronger than ever. And so the it was no coincidence, of course, that 
we never had a Punjabi candidate or a Sikh candidate for that matter. And now we see huge amounts of backing for either or candidate and um, signs everywhere and posters everywhere and support just flooding through the gates. And so with that, politically, we'll see that growth. Socially, as I've mentioned, folks are elated. We're, we're, our community is so happy to the point where every Sunday is the piece of conversation. Everybody is talking about redistricting. Oh my gosh, last, last Wednesday or last Tuesday, did you guys see that? Oh, did you all see that um, when there was a high schooler or there, was, there were multiple community members who have never come out to these city, city council meetings that were brought out to really advocate for um, not just the Punjabi community, but all of us. And so socially, folks are becoming more aware that, okay, we have that power, and it's just a matter of really learning and educating ourselves and uh, having the allies to do that, and environmentally. So there's a, uh, there's a different flavor in the air. We're feeling optimistic. We're feeling um, hopeful that the future of Bakersfield for our children, we're not going to have to worry about sending our children to school with Bakersfield City and worrying about, oh, my child wears a turban. Oh, my child has facial hair. Or, oh, hopefully my child is not going to be called a terrorist. Because those are realities that we all had to face. You know, we may look different, but inside, of course, we're all still the same. We got feelings, we have emotions, and, um, you know, it's hopefully this will create that impact in the educational space, right? So our children are looking and saying, oh my gosh, Didi, I really want to major in social policy and public service. What? Wait, okay, that's unheard of. Our CSUB, predominantly, a lot of our community members are nursing majors. Predominantly for me, actually, it was influenced that just be a bio major. Be a bio major, go into medicine, do that, do your thing. Well, to my parents' surprise, I was like, oh yeah, so I'm gonna go uh, undeclared, guys, and uh, not gonna be a doctor. And, and that was the revolution, right? That's the social revolution that we're seeing within even just locally. So folks seeing Manpreet Kaur, youth seeing her, a person of color, somebody who looks like them on a billboard running for council, it's inspiring in so many ways. And so they're starting to think, wait, I can go to council meetings and advocate for my rights and advocate for my community's rights. So wait, should I run to be an intern for, or should I apply to be an intern for the council? Yeah, you should. <laughs> and you can get those the weekly experience of working with folks who are planning and building your community. And so we have students who are working directly now after uh, the redistricting process that were inspired to apply for those positions. And there's only two per, per council member. And so getting those students in there and they're inspired and more motivated than ever to really get involved in the political process even prior to them being eligible for voting. They're doing registration booths, or voter registration, uh, or Gordoare, or the sixth place of worship, every Sunday now. And these are folks who are not even 18 yet. And they're like, okay, we gotta get you. I can't vote, but please, please make sure you vote, because you have the power to build that change. And so, um, it's just been working wonders, and being that we have 10 plus registered Gordare or sick places of worship locally, that number is growing every year. And it's because we have such a large, the population is booming. Our Punjabi population is growing every day. We're the third most spoken language in the Central Valley, right behind Spanish and Tagalog. So we know that Punjabi, the Punjabi community is here. We're growing and it's just, every day is a, is a new journey and I can't wait to see what we achieve and I'm looking forward to kind of seeing the real ramifications and the impacts that long term, this generational change that will happen. Um, so thank you for to the library for bringing this opportunity and just all the background and the legwork because it is a lot to organize. And so um, I mean, um, everybody who really just put this together, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm going to tear up a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, it's just everything sounds so like hopeful. <laughs> it makes me tear up. Um, so thank you, Harvey. Uh, speaking of hope, our last question is for Lori Casante. <laughs> what hope do you have for our society's ability to share power more equitably in the future? All right, this is the age-old question, right? 
I mean, um, when my grandfather passed away, I inherited his library, and um, his library contained books that he used to write his own book about the Constitution and about um, what would make for the strongest language you could put in a Constitution, and how many of the features of his ideal Constitution were like these independent redistricting commissions, and the idea that everyday people having the access to education and, and clean water and you know clean air and the ability to feel useful and productive in society, when everybody has that, we all win. When everybody wins, we all win, right? And, and I think that's a basic assumption that I carry with me every day that I hear about things that make me feel less hopeful. And in fact, it's kind of funny. I think my husband, if he knew I was answering this question, he would be kind of shocked. <laughs> because I'm not gonna lie, I don't, these glasses, they're not rose color, okay? I, I read, I, I pay attention, I know what's really going on. I listen to experts like Donato who tells me about the facts about what's going on. I am not deluding myself. And indeed, when I first engaged with the city of Bakersfield, out of the 30 plus jurisdictions where we were going to engage the community in the redistricting process, Bakersfield was the number one on my list, least likely to have an equitable map at the end of the process, least likely because I found out a bunch of things about how they were avoiding the process, hiding the process, not going to hire the right experts to do the mapping, like lots of really, really not good conditions for community mapping. And indeed, I knew that there was a, a widespread understanding of an analysis that had been done that said that the city of Bakersfield, out of the seven wards, they should be drawing three to four Voting Rights Act districts, but they were only gonna draw two. And in fact, um, one of the council members said at a hearing, well, I know that this map over here is illegal, but as soon as I have a chance to vote for it, I'm gonna move to vote for it. He said that from the days, and I told you, you can look up the videos. They, the Fair Maps Act says they gotta be on that website for the city of Bakersfield for the next 10 years. You can watch it. but Bakersfield ended up being the best map. I have never in my life walked into a city of Bakersfield council meeting and seen a Punjabi interpreter interpreting. Never in my life. Never in my life. Sitting side by side with the Spanish interpreter. And guess what? We benefited so tremendously. Tiny, tiny, tiny little thing, but sometimes it's the tiny things that are the biggest. My daughter just turned six. And when we went to the Gurdwara to celebrate that beautiful map that we created together as a community, she got to eat their food. And by the way, they offer food every day for everybody who wants to go there. Like, they never turn anybody away. And so every day she passes the Gurdwara, she's to my daughter tells me, I want to go eat at the Sikh temple, mommy, because their food is really good. <laughs> Would that have happened if we'd have stayed in our red line? If we'd have stayed outside our red lines, if we'd have stayed in our racially restrictive covenant areas, or whatever the modern day equivalent of it is, we'd be missing out. We're missing out on so much. The next redistricting cycle, I want there to be next to the Punjabi and the Spanish interpreter, a Tagalog interpreter. I want there to be a Mishteko interpreter. I want there to be a Greek interpreter. I want there to be an Arab interpreter. I want there to be an Urdu. Whoever is in Kern County, the next time we go through this process, they get to be a part of it. And they get to be a part of it because we're going to have an independent redistricting commission where everybody is welcome. We're going to be voting soon on November 8th. And you know what is beautiful about that? Lots of things, right? They have an access table, a language access table in every polling place where if you want to find voting materials in all of the different seven different languages that Kern County is supposed to offer, you can go to that table and get that language access. We have the tools in place to form a more perfect union. Being here today and being a part of not having rose-colored glasses, facing the disproportionate impacts that I've got with my, because look, Cal and Fiber is free, 
Guess what? Same exact areas that don't have voting power under the current map, no coincidence that they're also the most pollution burdened, lowest education attainment, attainment etc. The hope that I have for the future is the fact that the Fair Maps Act has now significantly and historically increased the participation of the public. People know gerrymandering now, they know the word. Like that's wild. Maybe not everybody, but a lot more than before. And people are aware of what it means. And the Fair Maps Act now requires, and you watch, in the next, before the next redistricting cycle, we're gonna have more legislation that is gonna open up the process to be even more democratic than even it is now. And when that happens, there's nothing you can work on that's gonna impact the power structure that everybody's been talking about more profoundly than redistricting. I've worked on many, 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 I was a public defender, I've worked, on, I've worked for legal aids, I've worked all over trying to make an impact. This is the most impactful campaign I've ever worked on, hands down, no question about it. And that's what gives me hope. Thank you, Lori, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, I think I'm gonna hand this over to Lynn now. <laughs> and I thank you everybody for coming. Does anyone have any questions? I'll be happy to bring the mic to you. I'm going to talk about this. Q&A time. Hi, as a native of Bakersfield, I'm kind of curious about my own um, historic um, subdivision that was developed in, I think, 1948. So perhaps Donato or Jesus might be able to answer this. I'm talking about um, Westchester, the newer part of Westchester that was um, north of 24th Street, boundary by F, and then Golden State, and probably Oak Street. I, I just wondered if it was red. Yes, so I, I do have that answer, and Westchester was one of the neighbors that I focused on. And Westchester does have racially restrictive covenants, and um, the way it was established was, um, it was, you know, you have like the old Westchester, right? You have the new Westchester. Since it is the post-war community, it, it does have a racially restrictive covenant, right? And, and it includes most of it. I, I think some of it is not included because it's like a dirt lot at that time. But all the houses that are built, they're built like in that, you know, we think of the modern subdivision era. They're built in that fashion. But yeah, it does have a, a, a restrictive covenant. So I, what I've done uh, in uh, collaboration with the Historical Research Center at California State University Bakersfield, I want to thank Chris Livingston for giving me some web space. And, uh, and you'll see it in the QR codes. I have some out here and then some there. So some of the resources that I've shown. Uh, but the HRC website will show you um, all the neighborhoods that have racially restrictive covenants. I'm working on later to uh, get the actual language up there, but um, it's been very expensive. But yes, uh, Westchester does have it. And then we have a lot of other neighborhoods. Uh, I mean, it's during that, that expansive track building era. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for your, your presentation. It was awesome. Um, I, as Donato mentioned, I, we were colleagues, and um, we've been working a lot on, um, you know, bringing or decolonizing, I guess, the archive, uh, especially at um, Cal State Baker. So we're a new archives, so we kind of have the luxury of, of being able to, to uh, bring in stories and, and um, you know, documentation of Kern County people of color. And, um, one, and one of the reasons for this is, I mean, when you go to archives, it's so hard to find information. Um, it may be scattered, you know, here at the Kern County Library or at the Kern County Museum, but nothing substantial. So um, I guess my question, it's a question and a plea, is um, how, are, how are your groups archiving your history? And if not, please um, document these, this history because as, as you see, you know, um, it's going to be important for our future um, generations. Thank you.